Oh, hello, Daniel. Hi there. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Okay. Hold on a second. What happened to him? And then what? That's more like it. The very first day I came here and I was living in a tent and it was a day that I felt so, so free uh, to be let go from the grasp of society. The motivation really came from freedom and to survive. Um, to have somewhere warm, to have a shelter, to have washing facilities. Daniel is un in, uh, occupying the land in an unauthorised way. If we allow one person to do it in one wood, that could open up the gates for a thousand people doing it in a thousand woods. And the problem there is that could have a disastrous effect on the biodiversity. Yes, wouldn't that be terrible? People turning their backs on the Babylon system and choosing to work on the emotional and mental distress experienced by living in that system by going back to nature. Indeed, these lunatics must be stopped at all cost and thrust back into the centrally heated double glazed prison cells they've just escaped from. This is the very definition of a low impact dwelling. I could build a thousand of these in this area of forest alone and from Google's high altitude imagery you'd be able to see exactly zero of them. Compare that to the housing estates on the edge of every town in the country which are creeping further out into the farmland and forests every year. But remember, it's the guys living in mud huts and semi underground sheds who are negatively impacting the biodiversity. I spent about nine months in and out of this site during 2017, digging and building, using power tools and even a chainsaw at one point. I moved in on February 14th, 2018. I have now been living here for over 365 days and no one, not a soul, has noticed me or even suspected what I may be up to. I guess to the untrained eye I just look like any other hooligan on a mountain bike. How can it be that when people try to do similar things, on their own land no less, they are harassed, bullied and forced to give up by the powers that should not be, local councils and self-appointed authorities? Are we not told by our so-called leaders that the environment is under pressure from man's unchecked activities in the pursuit of profit? Are we not told that it is on us, the individual, to make lifestyle choices that reduce our impact? They provide what I call pressure relief valves, designed to allow people to feel like they're doing something without having to make any significant alteration to their comfortable lifestyles. Examples of these pressure relief valves would be household recycling, David Cameron's 10p plastic bag charge, tax breaks designed to encourage people buying a new car to buy a slightly less thirsty one, carbon neutrality for the biggest corporate offenders, Energy efficient light bulbs. Pardon my French, but are you fucking kidding me? This is how we're going to avert the biggest crisis ever to face humanity. Now, I don't mean to say that if you're not living in a hole in the ground, then you're not doing your bit. Not at all. One of the most revolutionary acts one can engage in is growing or rearing your own food somehow. Even if you do nothing more than grow some herbs in a window box, that's great. Anything that reduces reliance on the system makes you a revolutionary in my book, and controlling the food supply is paramount in controlling any population. I tried growing vegetables once, not my forte. Building a stealth off-grid bunker in the local forest though? Born to do it. Shelter is right there at the base of the pyramid in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, along with food and water unquestionably fundamental to life and almost completely controlled and regulated by the system. Off-grid, 
low impact, self sufficient housing of any kind, within reason, should be praised and supported, not outlawed and punished. I guess it's where I draw the line and where the self proclaimed authorities draw the line that we must disagree. The myth which prevails through every aspect of statute regulation and legal chicanery is that these rules were made in the best faith by honest individuals acting on the people's behalf, and that the more rules and regulations we have, the better, fairer, safer, take your pick, the system becomes. In truth, they are converting our rights into privileges and selling them back to us. They are generating statute regulations primarily as instruments of revenue creation. The fact that we've taken it lying down for so many successive generations is the reason my friend the off-grid Norseman was criminalised for keeping some fish in a barrel, among other heinous crimes, on his own private land. Everyone has different latent abilities, and many of those will remain hidden until they become necessary at a certain point in the future. There is no way my school teachers could have predicted the sort of trajectory my life would take and thus guide me towards practical basic construction methods, bicycle building and maintenance, and video editing. These things I had to discover for myself when the time was right. I'm very grateful for basic maths and English, but in the long run necessity is the mother of self-reinvention. Funnily enough, the vast majority of people I've met on this journey refused at some point in their young life to be moulded by the education system. If you're a young person watching this and you feel like you don't fit, quit. Put your time and energy into something worthwhile. We have to build the alternative to the system ourselves. I feel like part of a genuine, although scattered, movement. I feel like I'm on the front lines of a battle most people don't even realise is being fought. I'm proud to be doing my part and grateful for the support I receive from friends and from the strangers who follow me on YouTube. There was no celebration for making it to a year out here other than the status update on Facebook, my first in several months. A big part of the reason I wanted to pursue this project was that I needed to unplug. I was in the middle of a very slow meltdown which began in about 2013 and it was killing me. I asked for help and something responded by planting in my head the idea of living in the forest through which I was commuting on my mountain bike several times a week. I didn't question it but instead moved some basic tools out here one night and began digging whenever I had a day or two free. Before long I had a sizeable pit over which I constructed a log roof. It was at this point I realised that this thing I was building was definitely going to be habitable and I began documenting the building process on YouTube. My first off-grid story video was uploaded on October 14th, 2017, and I've consistently added to that playlist, including the day I finally made the leap to living outside the fence, albeit still on the farm. I remember feeling high almost constantly in the early days I was living there. The sunlight and fresh air, the feeling of freedom. I hadn't even finished the floor. I slept on the bare earth at the bottom of the bedroom pit, still not 100% certain the walls weren't going to collapse and bury me alive. There was so much work to do, but now I was living on site, I could put in the hours. I've never attached much significance to birthdays. But seven days after moving out here, I turned 34 and entered my seven year in numerological terms. I was cycling to my parents' place and on the way I passed a parked vehicle with the registration plate 3434D. My new age, twice, and also three plus four equaling seven, twice. Whatever had urged me to do what I did, had put the design in my head which would enable me to effectively dig my own refuge, was celebrating with me now. It wanted me to know I had done the right thing and that it was pleased with my work. All this was felt directly in the heart and I knew the truth of it. But I doubted what I'd seen. I went on the DVLA's number plate checker service and sure enough there was the plate. And just as I remembered, it was registered to a silver Land Rover. I didn't see that vehicle again for a whole year, although every time I have passed that spot on the road, I've looked. And then one evening, very recently, I spotted it again, in a car park to the side of the road. 
So having looked up the significance of seven as a year number, I learned from Christine Delory's Creative Numerology website that seven energy flows in an atmosphere of privacy, solitude and quietness. It is constantly seeking answers to its steady stream of questions about itself and life. It is seeking truth, wisdom, dignity, fulfilment and perfection. The seven journey can be confusing or even depressing. No matter how much you want to surge ahead, this is a year of learning how to create the conditions you truly want for yourself. In the process, the seven year will expose you to aspects of your life with which you have become dissatisfied, so that you can realise just how satisfying your life can become if you're willing to make the changes that need to be made. Only then will you know where you truly belong in this rapidly evolving and uncertain world. And that is exactly the spirit in which I have lived this past year largely isolated without internet or a phone line. I gave up the mobile phone, I quit Facebook and then returned under an alias with which I communicate only with those I would otherwise lose contact with entirely. I travel everywhere by bicycle. I work no more than three days a week. I cut from my life all relationships, places and things which were in any way superfluous, unhelpful or antagonistic. I have lived in alignment with the spirit of the vibration of the number seven. And although it is difficult for any of us to do, I made change a part of my life. I came closer to the truth of who I am and there is no going back. Did I find out where I belong in the rapidly evolving and uncertain world? That's another story. This is my eight year now. It probably goes without saying, but I am occupying this tiny fragment of National Park Woodland without permission. Without permission from the human being who claims ownership of it, or the government body entrusted to manage it. I do so in the same capacity as the squirrels and pigeons who nest in the trees, and the deer who roam the area. They have no concept of ownership or permission, no regard for fences or borders. Ideologically, I have more in common with them than I do with the people who come here in daylight hours to walk their dogs. Am I a wild animal? No. I used to be a farm animal of some kind though, and now I'm feral. So what might happen then if we did have a thousand people doing this in a thousand woods? What if they shared the experience online and they each encouraged another thousand to do it? In a population of 66 million, would one million be enough to constitute a tipping point capable of creating an exponential realisation among the masses that in fact there is another way, and that maybe the lowest common denominator carrot and stick rat race based system of government which has prevailed in this country for generations, maybe it needs an overhaul. And when I say an overhaul, I mean completely ignoring in favour of following one's own moral compass and intellectual integrity. If anyone out there thinks anarchy means rioting and looting, you, my friend, have let the newspapers do the thinking for you. Who writes rules for the deer? Who makes laws for the trees to follow? This is anarchy. Nature is anarchy. A perfect system, in balance, with infinite free energy for all. Why is that so hard to grasp? The missing ingredient and the one thing which stands as a barrier to every single avenue of human development is an insufficiently developed level of consciousness. This holds true both on an individual and on a collective level. What do we do about it? Go within and the way will become clear for you.